side. A bunch of stuff. This is kind of neat. This is my book in Zero G. It's my crew notebook. Things just kind of find their place and they fold out. You need big clips like this to hold stuff in place. There is Velcro everywhere, all over. Space Station, uh, thousands of switches. He's wearing a sweatshirt, uh, flights, uh, G suit like this, thermal underwear, and then they get down and put their uh, suits on, these big orange things or parachutes. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the space shuttle, a lot of things to learn, a lot of things to memorize. Uh, it needed, it's teamwork. You have to have teamwork to do something like this. Next slide. We spent about 13 days, almost 14 days in space. Jim flew the vehicle back. I remember turning on final and thinking, I have no idea how he's flying this thing. I felt like a thousand pounds. I've never felt so heavy in my entire life. And I, I just amazed that Jim, Jim was his sixth flight in space, fifth time as a commander, fifth time actually flying the shuttle. I sat between him and Paul as a flight engineer. Uh, when we landed, we taxied out, we stopped. Uh, I'm glad my seatbelt was on because if it hadn't been, I would have fallen face first onto the dash, onto a panel because I felt so heavy. I was nauseated, I was throwing up, I was, my heart was beating like you would not believe. I had no idea what was going to happen to me. But Mike L.A. comes out of the flight deck, mid-deck, bouncing up, you know, hey, how are you? I said, would you get that switch back there, otherwise I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I couldn't turn around. And it took me about a, about a day to get where I could actually walk again. Uh, I walked there for about an hour, but it was under the assistance of some people. And I just really rec I never recognized what happened to me. Everybody's different when they come back from space. Uh, they wanted to take me off in a gurney, and I said, no, 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 I'm going to walk off the space shuttle. I said, oh, don't worry about it. Your kids won't see you. Yeah, they won't see you. They'll be downstairs. And sure enough, I walk off. I did walk off with a flight surgeon hanging on my arm. And there were my daughters standing right in front of me. And I'm like, yeah. And, uh, and, well, Daddy, what's wrong? I don't feel it very good. And uh, so, well, you look drunk. <laughs> I haven't been drinking. No. Um, but it was interesting because they came with me and I, they, they took me into this, uh, it's called a uh, uh, orthostatic intolerance. You ever stood up really quick and you get dizzy? Well, that's because the blood decides to stay down here and not up here. And so when you come back as a rookie, they actually put you on a tilt table and uh, they put a, uh, an ultrasound on your carotid artery, they put a blood pressure cuff on you, they put EKG on you, and they, they strap you, they strap you to this table with my kids sitting all around me. and. Uh, they strap you to the table, then they make the kids leave for good reason. Um, they tilt you up at about this rate, and they stand you up. But what happens when the blood pressure drops in the body, your, your blood, your vessels constrict to maintain that pressure uh, to your noggin so you, you can function. After a few minutes, your veins get tired. They say, I'm done, and they, and they relax, and all of a sudden your blood pressure goes whoop. At about nine minutes and 40 seconds, usually it's about 10 minutes, they give you this 10 minutes, I wasn't going to let this thing happen to me. Nah. At nine minutes and 40 seconds, my blood pressure went boom, and I went ding, and they uh, lower the table back down. Uh, but every, everybody's different. Um, there's another thing, it's a, a chair that rotates called an OVAR, off vertical axis rotation. And I did that before I flew in space, didn't measure the stagmus and how my eyes react to you know, accelerations for your inner ear. And I came back, I was supposed to do it when I came home and, and sit in this chair and spin. I told the guy, I said, I'm sorry, I, I'm already spinning. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get in your chair because it would not be pretty. Um, so you do a bunch of different experiments. But this was 14 days of, of just absolute, total professional satisfaction um, to go up and do something like that in, in, in that manner. Next slide. So let, uh, that's, let me talk about, that was a flight. Let me talk about the important stuff. You know, flying in space is a very, very wonderful thing. I think everybody in space, everybody on the Earth should have the opportunity to fly in space at some point in time and see our world from a different perspective. If you could go up and you could do something satisfying and do this work, um, there's that much more to it. I think one day we're going to go back to the moon, we're going to go to Mars. We've built stuff on space station that's been flying in space for eight years, been operating perfectly for eight years. Stuff that doesn't work, we fix it and we go on. Space Station is a perfect vehicle for doing engineering for long duration space flight. Okay, the science is something else. We, it's a great platform for science, but we need to be able to occupy it with enough people to do quality science. We're getting to that point. The Space Station should be done here in a couple of years, and then we'll, we'll have the opportunity to do that, do some science, that, because the body does change when it flies in space. And there's a lot of things we need to know about that long duration to go off and do something productive. 
but you know, why would we do that? What is, what is it within ourselves? Why do we have to make, make it off this planet to go do something else? One of the things that we need to do, and I think in this country we have a very, very skewed perspective on what's important. This won't be a political commentary, but it'll be a commentary. You know, we, we're willing to pay a basketball coach $6 million a year to coach basketball. We'll pay somebody $20 million for a four-year contract to throw a baseball. But we won't pay a starting engineer more than $50,000 to be an engineer. We do not pay teachers to give people the education to change the world. But we'll pay a guy a lot of money to shoot a basketball. That person is not going to change this world. That person is going to entertain us. That person is going to show us what's needed to be very good at sports. But we pay the money to go watch that person because we want to be entertained. It's the kid that's out there learning math and learning science and doing something and building something, he or she, building something where they get a sense of satisfaction of having used their brain to create an object that does something. That's the kid that's going to change the world. That's the kid that's going to make our life better. The things that we have today in our life that we have, uh, we take for granted on a daily basis, be it those cameras that are back here, this computer, quartz watch I'm wearing, running shoes, um, skags on windsurfers, I mean, just all kinds of different stuff. A little, a little thermometer you put in your daughter's ear at night and she's sick. The gold film in that is a byproduct of the space program. Okay? Smoke detectors. Uh, the fact that when you got some nasty storms come up in the southwest, you know it's going to be bad. You know, we know about it. We take it for granted that a lot of that is a result of the space program. And we spend about, this is a few years ago, about $8 per person per year to operate the space shuttle. This was in 2000. About $3.2 billion. Well, if you divide that by 270 million people in the United States, that's about $8 per person per year. The same year, we went out and spent $25 per person per year on Halloween. We were more interested in spending money on costume and candies, okay? And people complain about flying in space. I'm sorry. I, I, I spent $50 that year on, on candy and stuff for my kids. But I don't think it's wrong for our government to go out and spend money to do things that we may not think about, to do something that we take for granted the stuff that we get. One of the things we flew on the space shuttle is an iodine removal kit. We move iodine, it's preserved out of the water, because on the Russian side, they can't use it damages their stuff, so we remove this iodine. Well, NASA has this process for doing it. Some guy took that process, went out and made a commercial product, and now he's out purifying water in the sub-Saharan Africa for families that have never had clean drinking water, okay? That is a good use of space technology, okay? And that's what's really important. So I think as, as adults, as educators, people in the university, you know, we have, you know, we're the voice that tells our government what we think is right in this world and what we want to do with our money that we spend our taxes on. What's this, April 16th, April 17th? I just dumped a lot of money to taxes. I want to see my taxes used for the right thing. And you know, we need to encourage kids by giving them mentors and giving them motivators and showing them what, why is it good to be an engineer? Why is it fun? What can you do with it? They don't see it on TV every day. You know, they might watch Mythbusters, they might see people doing stuff on TV that are fun. We need to have more of that. We need to show them why it's fun to be an engineer. Why is it fun to build a robot when you can do something? Because those are the kids with that knowledge who will often do something absolutely remarkable. Somewhere I, th I think, you know, basketball's great, football's great, it's fun, need to watch and everything. But we, in, our, in this country, need to really kind of reset our priorities on how do we get our kids interested in doing something that's going to make their life better. My dad told me the other day, he said, you know, this is probably the scariest time in his life right now in terms of what's going on in the world and uh, elections coming up and gas and food and biofuel, all these things. He said, this is really the scariest time. And, and for the first time, I'm really looking at it going, yeah, what are we going to do in 20 or 30 years? Okay, when we don't have the people in, this, in the United States.